Okay, I think we can begin. And uh, we continue to study uh, various regression models. And before we start uh, with the new topic, I want to um, make a step back and uh, to discuss the following, the following story. So the topic of today's lecture is uh, regression models with uh, with random effects. And uh, to explain uh, what it is and why we need these random effects, uh, why we possibly need it, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the following problem. Let us assume uh, that we do the following experiment. Uh, we have several informants. And uh, for example, they are from different cities, uh, like from Moscow and from St. Petersburg. And uh, we are interested in uh, some linguistic feature uh, of their speech. Uh, for example, uh, we are interested in the length of the sentences that uh, they use. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a hypothesis, we have a question uh, like, uh, is it true uh, that people from Moscow Uh, use um, longer sentences compared with people uh, people from Moscow, uh, people from Saint Petersburg. Um, for example, we are interested in written speech. Uh, so we, we have this informants, several people from one city and from another city. And we can ask them to write some texts. And uh, what, uh, what would you do next? Uh, can you can you describe this experiment, the setting of this experiment, if you want to answer this question? How would you conduct this experiment? Do we control the texts themselves? Somehow? No, no. Uh, we can elicit free speech. For example, we have some prompt, and uh, we just ask. Uh, people just to write a short, uh, a short text, short essay, for example, and prompt the same to be sure that this is not a prompt specific feature. Probably there are several prompts that are given to uh, each informants. So. What to do next? So let us begin. Uh, we uh, ask each informant uh, to write an essay. Mm. 
uh, on a particular topic. So what would you do next? We'll count uh, uh, like quantity of sentences maybe and length of each sentences. Uh, count length of each sentences. Okay, so you have length of each sentence. So uh, we basically have a data frame like this. Uh, we have informant. Uh, then we have city. And um, uh, in each text, we have several uh, several sentences usually. Uh, so we would get uh, several lengths uh, for each text. So for each informant, we will get several several values uh, of this variable length. Uh, and uh, it will, would be like this, uh, informant AA from Moscow. Um, first sentence is of length seven. And for the same person, second sen sentence is of length 15. And the same person, uh, And we have another person from Moscow and uh, the sentence 30 and so on. And we have some person uh, from uh, St. Petersburg and um, something like this. Uh, what would you do next? Excuse me, I just lost you. Oh, we don't hear you now. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, we have this data and and this question. And how would you answer this question using this data? Which statistical tool would you use? Found by summarize by the city. Uh, so, and what next? And then I think we can um, get the mean or the median value mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of different city. Yes, okay. We have to compare two means. Yes, and how to do that in a statistically rigorous way. Which statistical tool should we use? So we find mean for each city. And then we have to use some test, like a t-test, uh, as Paulina suggests, and uh, compare this, this means. Um, so use t-test uh, to check uh, whether the difference is significant.
Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, this is rather standard approach. I but uh, it has some problem, in fact. Uh, can you see the problem? The speaker or the writer could also affect. So maybe someone just uses longer sen sentences, and it doesn't matter which city they are from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, uh, if we discussed uh, when we discussed this uh, t-test thing, uh, we said that the observations uh, that we uh, that we consider in this t-test that they should come um, like. It is a sample. I mean that we have we have just some box with balls, and we are interested in the mean value of numbers in this box, and we select these numbers just by random selection from this box. So all these uh, all these numbers uh, have the same probability to be selected, and. Uh, the procedure that we actually used to collect this data, uh, it is, it does not agree with this description, because uh, in this case, um, the, uh, this description corresponds to a case when, for example, uh, we get uh, one sentence from each participant, one one sentence from each informant. Then we can think about these balls as uh, like a participants and we select random participants and for each participant we have only one observation. But uh, in this case, we have a more, um, more complex structure. Uh, first, we randomly selected participants, uh, our informants from the whole population of Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then each participant, each informant generated several observations, several numeric values. So uh, these numeric values, for example, can be different from the numeric, uh, from the numeric uh, values that are obtained from the second informant. They, this, this can be different distribution of numbers. So basically, uh, this, uh, this, this is a more complex data generation process then just a simple uh, sample selection, uh, like we discussed. Uh, and you know, we can see very clearly that uh, this procedure that we discuss here uh, can give us uh, incorrect results. In, in, in what sense incorrect? Uh, incorrect with respect to the question that uh, we are asking. Uh, why? Uh, let us consider a case when we have only two informants in each, uh, only one informant in each city. Um, Uh, so we have a table like this. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, rows that corresponds to first informant uh, from Moscow. And we have some numeric values here. So again, this is informant, this is city. And this is length. And uh, we have some uh, another informant. And again, we have a lot of observations for this informant. Uh, this informant is from St. Petersburg, and we have uh, some values here. Uh, it is possible that we have a lot of numbers here and here. Uh, like if both informants generated a very large text, it is possible that they started writing and can't stop. And it is possible that uh, we have a significant difference between this set and this set of numbers. 
but does it give us uh, does it give us positive answer to the question what we were asking for to this question? No. Why? Why not? Because we have like two samples that correspond to different people. Mm -hmm. And we don't know anything about cities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we, we compared to we compared to informants. We did not compare to cities. It is possible that if we select informants in other way, then we will get different result. Uh, so you see that uh, in this case, even despite the fact that we have a lot of data, we have a lot of observations, it does not, uh, it, it, is, it is very easy in this case to obtain significant result from statistical point of view. But this, is, this result does not give us the answer to the question we are actually interested in. We are interested in the difference between cities not informants. And uh, this shows that if uh, we have the data set that is uh, obtained not by a procedure like this one, when we independently sample all our numeric values that uh, we want to put into t-test, if, if, if uh, the data collection process is not like this, then uh, we have to be very cautious when we apply statistical tools and we have to apply appropriate statistical tools. Uh, let us return to this initial, uh, this initial uh, setting. Uh, how would you fix this problem? Are there any ideas? Now we have several informants in each city. And again, uh, I want to answer the same question like this. How would you do it to overcome the issue that we just discussed? We can calculate the mean mm -hmm. by every person and then compare like this means. Exactly, exactly, yeah. In, in fact, if we, uh, if we just uh, aggregate uh, per person and find mean, uh, then we would get uh, another, uh, another data set where each informant uh, provides uh, only one observation. So we have informant, we have city, and we have average length. And uh, now uh, this is uh, much more correct uh, to analyze this data set because now we can say that data collection here uh, corresponds to something like this because we can think that each ball here is one informant and the number that is written on this ball is the average uh, sentence length pro uh, generated by this informant and then uh, we get these informants randomly and independently. And uh, we are uh, quite well in the settings of the t-test. So this is one approach is to aggregate this data uh, per informant. Uh, but this is, uh, this is applicable for, uh, for this simple test. But if you have something more complex like regression model, you have to uh, you have to uh, adapt uh, this model for this kind of problem. So Uh, let me rewrite it as a um, uh, rewrite this test uh, as a regression. Uh, 
Uh, so I have the following model. Uh, I have length of a uh, sentence. This is my uh, dependent variable. And uh, it is a function of Uh, as usual, we will use dummy variable like city. Uh, okay, wait, wait, let it be city Saint Petersburg. Uh, this uh, uh, this problem is the same uh, as this is the same problem as previously. So this is uh, this is just another way to think about the t test uh, to think about this regression problem. Uh, let us uh, check that everybody uh, that uh, everybody remember how to interpret uh, these things. Uh, how would you interpret beta naught? What is beta naught? Is intercept. Yes, but uh, in this uh, in this problem. So now I work with my original data frame without aggregations. And um, I believe that sentence length is given by this linear equation. Uh, what is B to naught? What does it correspond to? So this sentence length predicted uh, if city is Moscow. Yes. In fact, uh, in this model, uh, beta naught will be find, found as average, average sentence length uh, for people in Moscow. Uh, because if a person is from Moscow, then uh, the value of this dummy variable is zero. And uh, you have only this equation. So on average, sentence length equals to B to naught. Of course, we do not assume that all people in Moscow have the same sentence length. But on average, uh, this equation should be satisfied. And what about B to one? How to interpret B to one? The sentence length is if for people from Saint Petersburg. Uh, beta one. Uh, you said that this is average sentence length for for people in Saint Petersburg. Uh, beta one alone or something else. So, if a particular person is from Saint Petersburg, what our model predict? as a sentence length that corresponds to this person. Mm -hmm. uh, so Alexei wrote in the chat that this is a difference. Oh, which difference? Mm -hmm. This is a difference between average sentence length uh, for people in Moscow and uh, people in Saint Petersburg, or better to say, people in Saint Petersburg uh, minus people are uh, in Moscow, right? Because if uh, if a particular person lives uh, in St. Petersburg, then for that person, the prediction of this model uh, in the, the predicted sentence length is a sum, beta naught plus beta one. 
So uh, B21 is the difference between St. Petersburg and Moscow. And uh, when you do uh, when you do regressions, uh, you can have uh, you can have an estimate of uh, this coefficient and also uh, its significance. So regressions in R. Uh, test hypothesis like meta one equals to zero. So basically, this is the same thing as uh, to do t test for our initial data. And uh, this is uh, this model. This is just another way to to think about this t test. But now I want to introduce uh, a bit more complex model that takes into account not only the city but also an informant themselves. So I will consider new model. And in this model, I will assume that the following holds. Uh, sentence length is determined uh, not only by the city, but also by some value that depends on informant. By the identity of informant. And uh, this value uh, is called random effect. And it is supposed to be uh, some for, for fixed, uh, so it is, uh, uh, actually, what uh, what this equation says? This equation says that the data that we generate uh, it is uh, it is created in the following uh, procedure. Um, so first, so we we assume that the data generation process starts with generation of informants. We generate some informants uh, from each city, and we assume that each informant uh, have their own tendency to use uh, long or short sentences, and uh, this uh, this is a characteristic of a particular of a particular person. And uh, this is uh, some random variable. So we first to generate participants. And assign them value of this u uh, that measures uh, how long sentences uh, this person usually produce. Uh, compared to Uh, average person of the same city. Uh, and uh, this assignment is random. Uh, 
is random and uh, does not depend on the city. So basically, we believe in the following in the following thing that before uh, a particular person born, they go to some very large, uh, very large box with um, numbers, and uh, they select random randomly from this box, and this number will be will indicate uh, how long or short sentence this person will uh, produce uh, relative to uh, relative to other persons from from the same environment this is some kind of individual effect uh, so this is this thing is called individual effect And after that, uh, for each person, uh, we generate several observations. Uh, with average sentence length given by that formula uh, so let me uh, let me return to this formula uh, so we say that sentence length is determined by a city and uh, it is also uh, determined by uh, this this personal uh, personal random effect individual effect and now uh, this model uh, this model corresponds to the data generation process that we actually use so indeed if we took into account the fact that it is possible that some person just like to do and like to produce text with large sentences, uh, then, okay, uh, this can be explained just by his personal, his or her personal uh, random effect, you. Does it looks reasonable? Sorry, maybe I missed. Uh, why why do, do we need this random effect to 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 fix what? Uh, this is this is exactly a fix of uh, the problem that we discussed here. Uh, that uh, it is possible that we have uh, several observations uh, from the same person, uh, and it is possible that individual effects, individual differences between uh, between these informants. Uh, is what we are actually measuring. So, for example, if we have only uh, one informant from each city, then uh, we absolutely sure that any difference that we measured are difference between uh, between these informants, not between cities. Just because we have only one informant from each city, and we want to take into account it. So we want to take into account the fact that particular informants uh, can have their individual uh, individual biases, individual tendency to produce uh, smaller or shorter or longer sentences. And this individual difference between people uh, can be, we, we want to, to split these individual differences between people and differences between city. For example, in this setting, we cannot do it at all. But if we have several uh, several uh, people in each city, then we can try. But to do it, we have to use an appropriate model 
this model should take into account uh, this fact that uh, informants are different. And uh, it is possible that they have different, uh, different, um, different habits in uh, producing these uh, words. But oh, and this is uh, this is given by this term. What we are expecting from this uh, random uh, random effect is that its uh, expected value is zero, uh, because otherwise, um, well, uh, we have we 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 want this uh, individual effect to measure the difference between a particular person and an average person uh, of the same environment. So we want this thing to be a difference from, from this part of the equation. And uh, so, uh, for example, if all these values are larger than zero, then we can make them to be zero on average just by increasing of this intercept. So we expect that this thing uh, is zero on average and the interpretation is here. Okay, let me uh, give you an example. Um, so uh, actually the, the, assume that I have something like this. Uh, I have several informants like and uh, this is informant from Moscow. This is from Saint Petersburg and so on. And Assume that I have uh, not, not one informant from each city, but a lot of informant from each city. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this model theoretically allows me to explain any difference uh, between this sentence length uh, with, this, with this value. So basically it is possible that I say, uh, okay, uh, people, uh, I have, for example, 10 people from Moscow and 10 people from St. Petersburg. But, uh, and I see from my data that all people uh, from Moscow uh, uses shorter sentences than uh, people in St. Petersburg, each of them. But uh, this can be explained by the fact that they have different value of this random effect. But uh, it uh, sounds very uh, unlikely uh, because uh, in this case, we have to assume that just by pure chance uh, for all people in St. Petersburg, we have positive value of this variable. And for all people in Moscow, we have negative value of this value. But uh, it is almost impossible if we said that we chose this value randomly and independently on other variables. So it is highly unlikely that we have to explain the difference between cities only by uh, this difference between, uh, um, between the value of these individual effects. Uh, because we assume these uh, individual effects to be chosen randomly, independently on other variables. And so, uh, so this, is, this is makes sense, but it is important that this random effect is really random. For example, if I uh, replace, um, if I add, uh, if I add informant, 
just as a new variable to my uh, data frame, uh, just, just, just as a simple uh, categorical variable, and I will get it converted to dummy variables, uh, then any effect of the city will be uh, uh, destroyed because in this case, if I do not have, if I do not place any assumption on the effects that are associated with this informant, then uh, of course it is possible that effect of the city will be explained uh, by effect of the informant. Uh, but th this is why I can't just put this informant to my model and uh, keep it like this. I have to put it in a special way, in such a way that uh, I have to say that I assume that uh, this is uh, this is indeed a, a random a random thing, some something something random random variable. And uh, we will do uh, this stuff. There is a library. Um, There is a library, uh, LME4, and we will use this library to uh, to to do this to do this kind of modeling. Uh, we will do it uh, at the exercises, and now uh, I want to add that it is possible that uh, random effect not only uh, present in this form. Uh, this is called uh, this is called a random intercept because uh, like we have different intercepts for different informants, and the intercept for a particular informant is a sum of this random effect and this uh, beta naught. Um, but uh, also, it is possible to include a random effect uh, here. So to make uh, to make some, uh, it is possible to consider some more complex models like like with random slope uh, like this. Assume that uh, we are interested in the uh, relation between sentence length and age. And we have something like this. And uh, we can also add so this is fixed effect model. Uh, fixed effects means that there are no random effects. And uh, we can consider uh, something different like uh, sentence length. Uh, this is called uh, this is called a random slope model. Oh, sorry, a random intercept. Uh, this is a um, case of uh, random effect. And uh, if uh, I would draw. Uh, the graph. Uh, then uh, the predictions uh, would be like this. So they would be parallel lines.
uh, the, uh, and uh, this difference between these parallel lines uh, would be given by the difference between this term. Uh, but also it is possible to consider random slope model. Something like this. We can add For example, we can add two random effects for each um, one, uh, one random effects will be just added to the value of this coefficient. And in this case, uh, I would assume that my predictions are arbitrary lines. It's possible that, for example, for one person, it is this line and for other person, it is this line and for uh, another person, it is like this line and so on. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to specify uh, these random effects, uh, but I think that uh, this is one of the most important one, uh, uh, important case, uh, case of random intercept. So this is random slope. Of course, it is possible that we have additional variables and uh, we can put, for example, several random slopes for different variables. But we have a problem that if we make model more complex, then uh, it will be um, less useful uh, in practice because the more complex model you consider, uh, the, it is more difficult to uh, train this model to find the coefficient of this model and uh, this process can be non-convergent and it is also possible that uh, the model that you uh, obtained is not very um, useful because it gives you predictions that do not generalize well. Uh, so this is a trade-off between capturing essential features of uh, the process you are trying to model and not over, not making your model too complex, too flexible. Uh, there are no uh, universal advices here. Just um, you can just have to use your intuition. Uh, so this is this is the story on random intercepts. Let me show you also a couple of examples. Uh, for uh, various uh, regression models. Yeah, I forget to say that you can also uh, do this not only with regular uh, uh, regression, but also with logistic regression as well. Uh, everything will be the same. And uh, this can be uh, this can be modeled uh, in this way also. Uh, let me give you now several examples uh, of some effects that of some of some phenomena that you can experience with uh, with regression models. Uh, not necessarily uh, not necessarily um, random effect uh, models. Uh, just probably simple regression models. Uh, first, uh, let us discuss um, how to take into account nonlinear dependence. Assume that you are studying uh, something like the dependence between age and salary. 
And you have a data that uh, give you something like this. Uh, uh, what would you do to model this data? How would you, uh, would you use linear regression to model this, this data? How do you think? Or what's the problem with, with linear regression? So why not? Because these points, they are not monotonously, like if the age uh, becomes larger, the salary at first becomes larger too, and then it starts to decline. So the mm -hmm. line would be bad in this case, mm -hmm. because the line doesn't predict this decline or, uh, over the like, exact age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in fact, uh, in fact, th this is a question without uh, ultimate answer. In fact, we can fit linear regression, and you can uh, get some value. Uh, we can get uh, we can get the slope, and uh, this slope will give you some information about an average increase of salary uh, each year, and uh, it is indeed average increase, but uh, you have to understand that in this case, you average this, uh, this time segment uh, where you have this decline and this time segment where you have, where you have fast increase. So when you average everything, you have something in between, some slope that it is slightly less than uh, this increase and, uh, but it is positive. So it is much larger than this increase here because increase here is negative. Uh, so you can do it, but you have to take into account that you, 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 your modeling is not absolutely correct. Okay, uh, uh, what other options you can uh, try with this data? If you don't want to stick with this linear dependence, what can you do? So here is linear model salary as a function of uh, a linear function of an age. Uh, are there any other ideas? Any other models that we can consider here? Hmm? Anybody? Something non-linear. Yes, like what? I don't know. Can we like make not one line but uh, continue our change our slope halfway somehow i don't know like uh, uh, to make a slope uh, a variable that depends on the age something like that yeah maybe mm -hmm. yeah but uh how would you do that Okay, what other functions uh, do you know uh, except linear one? Can you analyze it with logistic regression? Uh, this is not a logistic regression because your dependent variable is salary. It is not, it is uh, not yes. a binary variable. It's just a usual numeric variable. Well, it looks like parabola. I don't know how to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, parabola is parabola. And uh, we can indeed, we can do it like this. 
uh, we can say that let us um, let us add this new term beta two times h squared, and then we can fit a parabola to this data. And uh, in fact, this new model is, well, it, it, it denotes some nonlinear relationship between salary and age. But in fact, uh, this can be considered as a special case of our linear model, because uh, we can just uh, put additional column to our data. So we had, uh, we had data like salary age, and we have some some numbers here and uh, then we can just add a new column h squared that is calculated uh, just by taking a square of this column and uh, then uh, you can fit a new linear model for this new data set and uh, you don't have to invent any new types of regression this is the same linear regression, but applied to this new data set. And in this case, uh, you can get a better approximation to your data. But again, you have to be very careful here because if you just want to get better and better and better approximation, you can add more and more terms like this. You can add H cubed, you can add H, uh, to the power four and so on. But uh, when you do that, um, you can get a line that looks like the following. Uh, it, okay, let me, let me write it. So it gives you a great, uh, for that point that you have in your data set, uh, they, uh, they, you, you have a great fit. All the points lie on the corresponding uh, on the corresponding line. But of course, we understand that this uh, very complex line uh, have nothing to do with the real data and the real data generation process. This is like salary equals to b to naught, b to one h, and b to two h squared and so on, beta n h to the power n. You can fit it, but it doesn't make much sense. Um, but if you're absolutely sure that your dependence is, is, is like this and you, have, and you have some reasonable consideration why it is like this, then you can probably try to use something like this heading of quadratic terms. But uh, again, uh, we have to keep our model simple, otherwise uh, they will lose any uh, um, predictive ability, ability to predict uh, something that is not used during the model fit process. And uh, another way uh, to, take, uh, in, uh, to take into account nonlinear dependence is uh, the following. Again, if we are speaking about salaries, it is possible that, it's possible that uh, this is, uh, okay, no, no salaries, let us discuss uh, something like number of words that a particular person knows at a particular age. And, uh, it is uh, really possible that the dependence uh, that we are looking for uh, looks like this one. So it is possible, for example, that at early stages of language uh, acquisition, uh, people increase uh, their vocabulary number of words they have, they can use. Uh, they increase it not with linear rate, but with exponential rate. And uh, in this case, uh, to do reasonable regression, you can transform your data 
Uh, for example, uh, to consider not number of words, but logarithm of number of words. Uh, in this case, uh, your data like this one would be transformed to something much more reasonable. Uh, because uh, the logarithm uh, have uh, a property that if you uh, if you multiply something by something, uh, then their logarithm are added. So if your dependence here is exponential, uh, like number of words is equal to like two to the number two to the h, uh, then uh, in this picture, this dependence uh, would be a logarithm of number of words uh, is logarithm of two to the power h. And uh, this is h times logarithm two. So now this dependence became linear. And uh, this is uh, also uh, used rather often if you really have a dependence that looks like exponential and you have reasonable ideas why it is exponential. And uh, the third story uh, uh, I wanted to discuss is the following. Uh, is it possible Uh, that adding new variable uh, into regression model uh, we dramatically change Mm, estimates of coefficients. And uh, the answer is yes. This is theoretically possible. And uh, I want to draw a picture that is very, uh, I like this picture. Assume that we have, mm, we have a picture like this. Uh, assume that this is some kind of medical data and we have um, uh, amount So we have something uh, something like amount of exercise. And we have uh, something like health. And uh, assume that we have a data like this. Uh, how do you think? Uh, what uh, if if I have only these two variables? amount of exercises and health. Uh, what our regression model uh, uh, will say us about the relation between these two variables. Is it positive or negative? How do you think? Uh, what is the slope of of the best fit curve. Yeah, it is It is positive. It would be uh, something like this. Uh, so if I have a model like health as a function of exercises, uh, then in this model, uh, beta one would be positive. But now assume that I have another variable. Assume that uh, these two groups of points 
uh, belong to um, different groups of people. For example, uh, assume that uh, some of these For example, one group uh, is adult and another group is children. Uh, then we have uh, another variable, uh, adult, and then can be either, uh, either zero or one. And uh, let me uh, consider a new model. Health as And let me assume that I have here, I have adults. So I will use different colors. So this is adults and uh, these are children. And uh, how do you think uh, what uh, our model says us now, this new model, what should it say? What can you say about this uh, beta one coefficient in this case? Note that now uh, you basically fit uh, two lines. If, uh, if I think about this model, it says the following. Um, this is a linear function of exercises, but uh, the, the intercept depends on the value of this uh, adult variable. So uh, if I uh, have to draw a graph of this dependence, uh, I have to draw two lines. One line corresponds to adults and another line corresponds to children. How these two lines uh, will be connected to each other? What are the relations between these two lines? So basically I have two lines. Uh, that uh, are different uh, with their with different with different uh, intercepts, but the same slope. This beta one, uh, it is a slope. It does not depend on uh, the value of this adult variable. So they have to be parallel. So I have to fit two parallel lines uh, to this data. One line uh, should fit these uh, dots, and another line should fit these dots. And uh, these lines, uh, because now uh, it is possible for these lines to have different intercepts, uh, these lines would be fitted like this. So like you fit two different models, but uh, with related beta one, uh, to these two different parts of your data set. And now uh, you see that uh, in this case, this beta one should be negative because you have negative slope here. So in fact, this is uh, an example of so-called uh, Simpson paradox. Uh, when we consider it, uh, our data, data set uh, without taking into account the group, then we see positive uh, relation between two variables. But when we consider it group-wise, so for each group more or less independently, then uh, we see negative dependence. This, is, this, this can happen, this happens in the real data sometimes. And uh, this poses uh, a difficult question of the interpretation. Uh, so when we, uh, when we 
do this regression and we see that this beta one positive. Does it mean that exercises uh, increases health? It is possible that it is not true. It is possible that, uh, for example, how can we explain this picture? Uh, probably children, they are healthy just because they are young. And also they like sport also just because they are young, they have a lot of energy. But if we uh, consider only children, we see that in this, for this picture, increase of number of uh, exercise decreases health. And uh, in this case, uh, adults, they do not uh, do much of exercise. So basically we can say that this variable exercise is correlated with uh, variable adult. And so uh, when we consider this model, um, we see in this, in this positive uh, value of this variable, we see not effect of exercise, but effect of being young. And exercises is just a proxy. And if we control for this, uh, uh, for this uh, age, if we control for this adultness, then we see negative effect of exercises. But if we do not control, we see positive effect of these exercises. So this is, pos this is possible. So again, we have to be careful uh, and to make sure that we took into account all the variables that can reasonably uh, that can reasonably affect uh, our processes and affect our um, how to say it causal uh, causal things in our model. So I think that that's all that uh, I wanted to discuss today. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, uh, we will stop for a moment and we, uh, we will continue in 14 minutes.
Hey guys, do you hear me? Yes. And now? Y yes, we do. Yeah, okay, okay, that's good. So let's continue. Uh, it's nice to meet you again. Uh, so now we'll uh, learn how to uh, how to do um, wait wait a second how to do linear mixed effects models in R and we'll see some examples. So. Dun, dun, dun. Why it's so slow? Why it's so slow? Okay, we need to. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. There are some problems with my computer and monitors. Just a second. All right. Um, all right, let's continue. So um, today we are going to learn how to uh, do linear mixed effects model uh, analysis in R. And let's first, uh, first start with uh, uh, uploading packages. So as usual, we use Tidyverse, uh, and because linear mixed effects models uh, is not realized in base R, uh, but there are uh, two major packages for doing uh, LME in R. The first one is uh, NLME, and the second one is LME4. 
Uh, basically, those two packages are written by the same person. And LME4 is a, a more contemporary version of an LMG written with more complicated structures uh, inside. So let's use this package. If you uh, don't have it, please use uh, install packages LME4. Uh, and we'll have, we'll see some examples uh, how to uh, how to implement it and uh, different examples of where can you use it. So I think I will just uh, give you this code. Uh, so this is a code for generation some uh, data. So you have here, uh, for respondents, uh, Alice, Bob, Claudia, Daniel, uh, for male, 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 and they have some uh, average reaction time. And imagine that we recorded uh, for each of them, we recorded uh, some uh, reaction times for for some task. Uh, for example, just a simple reaction time. So just uh, you see uh, uh, cross, you must press the button. Uh, and of course, different people, uh, they have different uh, average reaction time. Usually uh, people who do sports, they are faster. Uh, uh, people who are older, they are slower. So there is some, some kind of uh, interpersonal variability, but in general, one person has some average uh, reaction time. Uh, but of course, if you, even if you are the same person, uh, when you do this task several times, uh, you have different uh, reaction times every time. So there is some variability. Uh, there is some variance in this. Um, and uh, here you have both uh, variability between subjects and within subject. So let's generate uh, from this respondent's data uh, keyball, uh, the next keyball, collect the data. Uh, I think I can just uh, copy paste, uh, copy paste you this code. Uh, I will send it to Telegram. So you can copy that and, and we can proceed. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay, so we have, let's have a look what we have. So for every person, we have some uh, average uh, reaction time and uh, some, uh, some recordings of reaction times. I think, uh, 20 of them, right? Uh, so each uh, each row is a is one reaction time, and uh, what we are interested in is whether uh, females are faster in general or vice versa. So, is there any uh, difference uh, in reaction time between two genders? Uh, so the first idea is to just use a t-test or lm for uh, this data set. Uh, and we actually, we can do it. Uh, we can try uh, to use a fu uh, function t-test. Uh, do you think it will be dependent t-test or independent t-test? Do you hear me? Yes, perhaps it will be, will be independent. Yeah, correct. It's independent test because one uh, reaction time for Alice uh, has no like correspondence to uh, reaction time for other uh, for other guys. But there is actually so 
prepared, we need to set false. Uh, as far as I remember, uh, paired equal false as a default, so we can just keep it like that, but I prefer to explicitly say paired false or true. Otherwise, uh, you will get mistake one day because you forget uh, forgot to, to, to explicitly set this argument. Uh, so yeah, you, you'll get this Welch to sample to test. Or for example, you can do just uh, original, uh, test, you know, difference is very small, especially if uh, you have the same variance between uh, two conditions, uh, between two groups. So it actually doesn't matter so much. Uh, and here you have very high uh, T score with very, very low P value. But do you, do you feel that there is something wrong uh, wrong about that? About uh, conducting t test here? So what is our sample size here? Just for people? Yes, but you can see that uh, degrees of freedom is uh, 78. So actually, uh, uh, we somewhat have a sample size of uh, 80 items, 80 subjects. So uh, it looks really, uh, sometimes uh, people really like um, when they have small sample size, I think, okay, maybe, maybe uh, uh, I have just 10, 10 uh, subjects, but maybe I can record one subject several times. And that's why, that's how I can uh, increase the sample. Or for example, they record several uh, reaction times for every subject and they put uh, the whole uh, data set for cheetahs, they have like virtually they have very big sample size. Uh, the result is uh, very significant, uh, but something is wrong about that. And what is wrong is that these reaction times are nested inside the subgroups. So because of this, uh, imagine the situation. Uh, if you uh, see original, original. Uh, data set. Look, we have here uh, for female, yeah, we have uh, two females. Uh, okay, we, we can even try another. Uh, let's do some, uh, let's set some heat to have the same uh, results uh, for everyone. So let's do set heat. 42, and let's check what we have. Look, yeah, we have an interesting situation because uh, in general, uh, everyone has RT bias. Uh, so something like uh, um, inter, uh, inter individual, uh, individual uh, average uh, reaction time. Uh, that is near nine or eight, but there is one subject, Claudia, that has much lower reaction time. Maybe because she's a young uh, Olympic champion or something like that. Uh, and let's run this collected data one more time. And again, uh, you'll get very, very significant differences. Uh, highly significant, uh, p-value is very, very small, uh, just because uh, you have many points from uh, this subject that are uh, very far from other points. Uh, so of course it is not, um, is, it is not correct to do it like that. So uh, if you recorded uh, several, uh, 
data points from one subject, you need to do something with that. Uh, the first, uh, the most simple approach is just to average uh, all these reaction times for every subject. Let's have a look what we have in this situation. Collected data, uh, group by, by uh, subject respondent respondent plus uh, gender we just set it to, to not use this um, variable uh, summarize t is equal to, uh, mean our team we action time. Yeah, we have the same uh, picture uh, as it was uh, before. So we have, after averaging this uh, random uh, variation for every uh, individual, uh, we get again um, this uh, lower number for uh, reaction time for this cloud, our Olympic champion. Uh, so uh, actually in this situation, let's say summarized data. In this situation, we can provide t-test. But the problem is that now our sample size is very small. Uh, actually we can try, I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that uh, t-test will work on so small uh, sample size. I think it will not, but let's try it because maybe it will, but I'm almost sure that it will not. Summarized data. Uh, weird or no false. No, it worked actually. Yeah, it worked. Uh, it's actually questionable um, practice to uh, calculate t-test when you have just two subjects on uh, in two groups. Uh, people usually say that it's uh, uh, nonsense just because it's nonsense. But I uh, uh, I saw an article that uh, uh, tried to defend the uh, position that using extra small sample sizes like that is not, is, uh, is, is actually not so bad. So there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's the one approach, the most simple one uh, is to just uh, summarize your data. Uh, I mean, average for um, every uh, person and then calculate details or whatever. Uh, but sometimes it is not really good decision. For example, if you are a psycholinguist, uh, you have a, uh, you give your uh, subject some words that you selected. Uh, and you have actually a question. Would, would you want to uh, average by individuals or by words? And there was a long discussion how to deal with it. And people try to average uh, uh, both ways and then calculate something like an average uh, statistic for that. But then they came to a uh, conclusion that it's better to use uh, the method that will uh, take into account this variability uh, instead of just averaging. And that was a uh, linear mixed FX model. Uh, actually, uh, it, it has many names in different, uh, uh, different fields. Uh, Multi-level modeling, uh, nested modeling, uh, hierarchical regression, and so on and so on. It depends on the field where, it, uh, where it's used. Uh, because uh, to the same conclusion, actually people came uh, in very different, uh, research fields from uh, social psychology and educational psychology, where, for example, you take subjects from some limited number of schools. Uh, so you have three schools and you want to test something, but you need to, to take into account this 
uh, huge difference between these three schools. And they will be, uh, usually it's bigger than uh, something else inside the schools. Uh, or for uh, experimental studies where you have uh, different measurements for one uh, subject or animal or whatever. Uh, so, uh, yeah, also we can try to do the same uh, as we did uh, with Qtest uh, using a uh, function ln for linear regression. So actually, uh, the syntaxes will be actually more or less the same. Action time, gender, da 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 da. Center. Yeah, but again, um, again, we um, uh, we cannot do it like that here because we have this additional parameter. Um, subject that we can can just ignore the problem is that we cannot uh, just enter it as a additional factor uh, that's interesting question why because uh, but basically because we we are not interested in this subject we think that uh, that subjects are something like a, a random variable and we not we are not interested in every particular subject we uh, assume in our model that uh, the subject means uh, or any additional subject per, uh, properties they are just uh, randomly selected from some population so uh, every uh, individual's uh, reaction time is some uh, random value from some uh, distribution. So that's why we use here not LM, but uh, uh, LM here function. Um, here, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, linear function. Uh, the syntax is, is pretty much similar. So we can copy paste it here. And I think it will, no, it will not work uh, this way because uh, Omer function uh, expects that you have at least one random method, uh, like uh, subject or whatever. Uh, and there is some specific uh, syntax to specify this random uh, effects. So you start with a circle brackets, uh, and uh, then you set vertical line. So to the right uh, side of the vertical line, you put your uh, uh, random variable. So the group uh, that randomly varies. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, it is a subject. Where is it collected? Data. Collected data. Respondent, as far as I know. Respondent. And to the left uh, of this vertical line, you, uh, as for the most, uh, most simple model, you just put one. It means that uh, you expect that there is some. Uh, variation, uh, individual variation uh, in uh, average reaction time, uh, and you want to test for uh, uh, for the uh, gender uh, fixed effect. So everything that is not random effect is a fixed effect. Everything that is not fixed effect is a random effect. Uh, and let's go to summary. So yeah, you get some results. Uh, what uh, what is the most interesting here is a fixed effect. Uh, do remember actually, uh, I'm interested in intercepts. 
If yes, and why? If no, why? What is the intercept? And uh, is it uh, is it something interesting for you? Oh, this guy from uh, linear regression when you had a LM, LM function, right? I think intercept is not very interesting here because we want like watch more on the slope. Is interesting. Exactly. So intercept just uh, if uh, for for intercept no hypothesis is that uh, reaction time is zero. It's just nonsense. We we know in advance that uh, reaction time cannot be zero. It uh, it will be always positive. So it doesn't really matter for uh, uh, especially for this case. Uh, the intercept line we just ignore. So it is not interesting for us. So whether it's significant, of course it will be significant, uh, even for very small uh, sample size. Uh, and what is uh, of particular interest is uh, this line, gender male. So we have an estimate for slope. We have a standard error. And as usual, key value is a, a is a uh, just estimate divided by standard error. So you can just check that this key value is just estimate divided by standard error. But the problem is that uh, this uh, package will not give you p values. Why? Uh, well, basically because uh, the after of this package just hates p values. He, he just hates p values and well, uh, he, he even uh, wrote an angry uh, article in some journal about why I do not put p values in my packages. Well, yeah. But actually, there is another package. Uh, it's called uh, Olmer test. That just gives you uh, p values uh, in this situation. Uh, on your test. Uh, actually, there is a reason uh, 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 why uh, the after uh, don't put a p value there. So, uh, this article is not just, uh, uh, I know, like poison for, for many pages. Uh, and the main problem is that, yeah, you get key value, but as you remember, for key distribution, we need to know. Uh, degrees of freedom. And estimation for uh, of degrees of freedom for linear mixed FX models is somewhat tricky. So there is no uh, one correct way to do that. So there are some different approaches, approximations. Um, well, actually uh, we can just use some conservative measure and it will be okay. Uh, and Almer test actually just uh, change functions for um, LME4 package uh, in this way that uh, it gives you p values where you want them. So you can see after I attach this package, uh, not so many things uh, changed, but uh, here we can see the degrees of freedom some estimation uh, you can uh, you can see uh, also t-test use uh, southern weights method uh, you can change it if you want uh, but it's uh, like default uh, option and it's quite good and even after of uh, lme4 uh, said that yeah that's okay that's okay i agree you can use it yeah if you want you can use it okay i don't mind all this stuff. So uh, then, yeah, we have uh, degrees of freedom uh, here as two. And now we have key value, we have, uh, we have degrees of freedom. Now we can calculate uh, p value. And you can see that it's actually not that high. You can even compare the results with a t test for summarized data. Actually, it's quite close. So the result of 
linear mix FX models model uh, is uh, quite close to what would we uh, have if we just uh, if we just use normal uh, normal t tests on average data. Oh, here it's even the same, yeah, but it uh, depends on uh, degrees of freedom estimation, of course. Uh, so, yeah, it's one way to uh, use um, uh, linear uh, mixed effects models, but uh, it's the most simple one because uh, here we just suppose that um, the only thing that differs between subjects uh, is uh, their average reaction time. But actually we can do much more complicated models and complexity of possible mod uh, of possible models is enormous with linear mix FX models. So do you have any questions for now? Because we'll, after that we'll go to another example. Any questions, any comments? Okay, if there are no questions, let's just uh, take uh, another data set. This one will be from, uh, this one will be from, the LME4 package. So if you upload LME4, uh, you can run this uh, comment uh, and this uh, package will be attached. Let's see what we have here. Sleep study. Oh, sorry. And you can So here we have uh, reaction times uh, again for several uh, for uh, every subject we have uh, several reaction times. Uh, but uh, this is a, a sleep deprivation a deprivation study where uh, people uh, had very low number of hours for sleep. You can even check from, as far as I know, it's real study. Uh, and there is even a link, yeah. Journal of Sleep Search. So you can uh, find uh, uh, the original article if you want. Uh, patterns of performance degradation and restoration during sleep restriction at some uh, subsequent recovery. A sleep dose response study. Journal of Sleep Research. 2003. Uh, so they recorded uh, average reaction time per day in milliseconds uh, for every subject. Uh, day zeros and one were adaptation and training. Day two was a baseline. And then they started uh, their uh, deprivation, sleep deprivation. That was actually uh having, uh having a sleep for three hours per day i'm not sure they uh, how they controlled it maybe they were recorded in the hospital or something like that or they used some devices or they just kindly asked people to sleep not more than three hours but i'm not sure that uh um, Anybody will uh, do that just to uh, finish the study uh, after day five, for example. So 
Uh, let's plot uh, this data and let's have a look how it look. Uh, what do we have here? Because it's really interesting to see uh, this result for uh, every subject. So you do the plot. Uh, for X, we will, of course, use days, right? For Y, reaction, right? Now we want to use jump line. Yeah, but also we need to divide it by, uh, by uh, different subjects. Uh, and for that, I will use facet grid, uh, facet wrap. I think facet wrap will be easier option. Wrap uh, subject, oh, it was subject, right? right. So facet wrap, just division of uh, one figure and several figures. It's something like a group by, but for the plot. Uh, I would also add point. So yeah, you have one day, one recording, you can see that. Uh, and also let's do some minimal just because it's beautiful. Yes. Or maybe even Kim Classic. Look nice, but look, look it's very scientific, but minimal is better. And also we want to uh, set uh, here I don't like that uh, it uses uh, continuous values for uh, X tail. So I will use tail X uh, continuous, but I will use, I will set breaks zero to nine because we have zero, one, two, three, and so on. This. Yeah. Okay. Now we have. Perfect figure. So you can see that uh, if you uh, look for every individual uh, person, maybe except one of them, that is quite, I don't know, he's very fast and uh, seems like sleep, sleep deprivation does nothing to him. Maybe like he is like, I know what doesn't kill me make a stronger guy or girl here. But uh, everyone else in general, after days of sleep deprivation, uh, have slower performance. And that's quite natural, right? Uh, but you can see that uh, average reaction time differs for different subjects. And yeah, that's something quite um, quite expectable, right? Because someone uh, is slower, someone is faster, and uh, it does not depend on sleep deprivation. But also you can find uh, that uh, for some individuals, uh, this sleep deprivation uh, influence more and for others it influences less and maybe for one it, it actually just even in, uh, even improve reaction time so uh, in this case uh, we can put inside the model uh, all these variations and we can even test which one is better So let's start with a 
most simple model that we actually know how to do. So in our model, uh, we want to uh, uh, we want to uh, explore how uh, day of deprivation uh, of sleep deprivation influence reaction time, uh, and include in the model that uh, every person have uh, has his own average reaction time. Okay, uh, let me, uh, uh, I want you to help me uh, to uh, write this model. Yes, let's start and do it step by step. So we use formula, as you remember, uh, what goes to the right uh, to the left side of the formula? Could you repeat one more time uh, what we try to find? Uh, like uh, we, we want to explore the influence of uh, the day of experiment on uh, reaction time, and of, of course we want to. Um, uh, how to say, принять во внимание, take into account that uh, that uh, we have data for different subjects. So we want to somehow include subjects as random effects. So what goes to the left side from Kilda? This. Uh, Mm, uh -huh. Not exactly. Wait, wait, from the left side, what yeah. uh, dependent variable? Right. Ah, then uh, reaction. Sorry. Reaction. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, okay. Uh, and to the right side, let's start with a uh, with what we know, with what we are good uh, good in. It's uh, good at uh, it's a uh, uh, fixed effect. So something that we uh, already know from just linear, uh, simple linear models. What we put as a uh, fixed effect here. The days. Right. So we are interested in days, basically. And it goes as a fixed uh, effect. And we know that like uh, we are limited in this number of days that we have. So we want to generalize our result in these days actually, uh, because we don't know what will happen after 20 days. Maybe individuals will die after 20 days of such deprivation. Okay, but uh, also we need to uh, write down uh, the uh, error effect. And I know it's quite complicated, but let's try to, to, to write it. Uh, so please help me with it. We put in brackets one, mm -hmm. bar, one. Uh, subject. Right. So our grouping variable goes uh, to the right is subject and one means just that we uh, model that uh, they have different reaction times, uh, they have different average reaction times and that's it. Uh, what's wrong? Why I have a mistake here? Why I have a, an error here? We didn't put data. Exactly. Thanks a lot. Uh, data is a uh, sleep study. And now we get some result. And let's get summary. So yeah, again, uh, 
we are not interested here for intercept in intercept uh we're interested here in days so each day uh increase uh reaction time by 10 milliseconds in general uh and we can see that t value is very high and uh this factor is significant but let's do also more complicated model and let's compare the models so to do that we need to save our model uh and i uh remind you that when you run a model or statistical test in uh, in R is not just you you uh, run a, uh, a function you and you get something uh, in your console as a result. You actually create a, um, object of some sometimes complicated class, sometimes less complicated class. Uh, in this case, it's quite complicated complicated uh, class because it's as four class that is not used by everyone. And that's actually why uh, the package is called LME4 because uh, the author uh, decided to rewrite this from more simple structure S3 to more complicated S4 that resembles object-oriented pro uh, programming a bit more than just simple S3. I don't know, maybe this knowledge will help you somewhere in life. I hope so. Okay. Model uh, RT zero because it will be our the most simple model. And now we want to do more complicated model uh, that will take into account that not only uh, not only uh, uh, average reaction time differs, but also uh, so not only interest for individual lines is different, but also uh, their slopes. So maybe uh, as for now, it will be better to visualize the results and see how our model actually was fitted. Uh, what do I mean by this uh, model fitting here? So uh, actually we fitted uh, uh, in our model, uh slope for everyone uh, with different intercepts for every uh, for each individual, uh, individual so let's try to uh, get predictions of the model we'll get some numbers and let's record it in our sleep study uh, predicted by model zero, let's say something like that. So now we have prediction for this model. And if we plot this prediction, we will get actually uh, this uh, regression lines. Uh, let's size. Let's add some drum line, drum line, but for Y, we'll use not uh, reaction, but this prediction, prediction predicted by model O. And let's use some color. I don't know, give me some color. It's time for your creativity. Name of the color or HTML code for the color, whatever you want. I guess red as usual will be a good one. Okay, okay, let's red, but not like uh, total red, but let's make some more deep and beautiful red. Uh, fired, отлично. Fired. Fired. 
let's try. I'm very interested in it. Yes. Sounds like uh, Grimes. Uh, we need to increase size, I think. Size equal to three. Oh, I think it's uh, this color is very is very uh, is very close to white. That's the problem because you can even check. Uh, this color, yeah, it's very it's too close to white. Maybe we can somehow. Like, okay, this nymph uh, uh, is uh, I don't know is more mature, uh, matured and experienced. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, but we can, we can go. We can make it more red, so it will be post uh, frightened nymph and red for frightened nymph. Red, green, blue. So let's do more CC. Uh, green. Uh, I would decrease it to this, maybe even this, and here like this, or maybe like this. So it will be a pink. Yeah, like, oh, I really like this. It's a Dolores Umbridge uh, color. Uh, I'm not sure that you can compare Dolores Umbridge uh, to Frightened Nymph, but well, no, well, why not? Uh, okay, that's one model, and you can see uh, for every subject, uh, intercept is different. So for some it's higher, for some it's lower, but the slope is the same for every subject. So now we want to try more complicated model when we want to fit also different slopes for every subject. Uh, to do this, we need to do actually everything will be the same, uh, but in, when we describe uh, error effect, we need to put instead of one, we need to put days. It will mean that we want to, uh, it, it, it will be e uh, either uh, one plus days, meaning that we uh, want to model uh, both, uh, every, uh, both intercept and uh, slope, or it, we can put just uh, days, it will be the same. It will mean that we want to, uh, considering a model, we, we want to model both individual slope and individual intercept. Actually, you can you can even uh, put this way if you if you put it zero plus days, it will model different slopes, but with the same intercept for everyone. So actually, you have a, a lot of flexibility, especially if you have more. Uh, uh, more predictors. Okay, model one. Uh, and let's do the same. We'll do, we'll add another picture. Uh, and yeah. Now let's add another line. Give me some color for this new lines. Whatever you want. You know, if, if something goes wrong, I will just somehow change it, like actually a lot, and it will be completely different. So just you can write like even random six 
symbols from zero to F and it will be I know, is there any, we, we can use some kind of uh, random number generator to, to have some random number. Or maybe you think uh, what can be a good uh, color that will uh, fit to the previous color. I think uh, it will, it should be um, from color theory, uh, Actually, color theory is not really a uh, good application for graphs because for graphs it's usually different. Uh, and in graphs, you don't want this clear colors. So this one is good, but it's dirty color. It's desaturated color. And we want to take something from the opposite side of the circle, but not like really, really opposite, but maybe somewhat to the uh, to the side, so color hex circle a wheel, uh, and we want to use what we have color. Yeah, and color two will be, uh, I expected that it will, okay, just do something. Uh, I don't want using, yeah, actually, I think something like this will be very, very cool color here. So you can see it's not in the opposite side, but just some, uh, left to right, and a bit more just yeah, I think it's a bit darker. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe uh, less desaturated. Yeah, I think. Let's try. I think it will be good. Plus, yeah. Yeah, I think good colors. Quite good. Quite good. I like it. I mean, really, not that bad. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, here we can see uh, that this model is more complicated, so it is more flexible. So it adapts for this more, uh, for these individual differences. And we can see that, uh, for example, for the third subject, uh, who has uh, dramatically increased in reaction time, the slope is higher. Uh, for this subject, it's, uh, the slope is even slightly negative, but for most subjects, it's, uh, it's close to the original one, to the like, average one, but for someone it's faster, for someone it's slower. Mm, and of course, uh, I think you remember that uh, if you add more uh, factors to your model, it makes it uh, more flexible, but also your model should not be uh, too flexible because, well, you can talk it, about it in different terms. Uh, one term is overfitting uh, that is used in uh, machine learning that you uh, overfit your model to your data. So uh, you fit it to some actually real noise. Look better so that both lines be seen. Lowest. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what they want. Can I make the right lowest graph? This one, 
look better. So that both lines. Ah, maybe maybe we can use alpha. Uh, interesting question because yeah, there is some overlapping. And it's quite. It's not clear what to do here. Uh, I would try to do some alpha, and in this case, we would actually want some more um, dark and distorted colors, or at least dark. But let's try it like this. Uh, but still, we can see these lines. Mm. Another thing that we can do, I don't know, it's very hard because uh, we can also use some alpha here. Alpha and here. So we will add some transparency and it will help us a bit. Uh, and also I like this trick that uh, you use uh, for points, uh, you use a uh, special shape that has some circle inside. As far as I remember, it's something like 24 or Whatever, something like that. I'm not sure. No, 24 is uh, triangles. Uh, let's see. I don't know. It's a very specific number. Uh, 21, I think, or maybe 19. Uh -huh. And yeah, but what we want here is that, so here a point has uh, the uh, contour that we can, uh, the, the line that we, we, can, we can color, and it has also some fill inside. So for fill, we can use fill equal to black, right? Yeah. But for color, we'll use white, and it will it will be shown as some kind of effect of uh, like a, something like a gala effect around uh, around dots. It looks really nice, and this effect is really cheap <laughs> to do in uh, Drupalot too. But I really like this effect. I use it a lot. And I think somewhat it made somewhat better as a result. I don't know whether you are satisfied because I actually don't know how to do it better because I think it's a limitation of a human uh, uh, human possibilities. Well, maybe we can, we could do something like that for lines maybe, but I'm not sure because I think for lines, it's always, uh, there is no such trick for uh, color and feel, but we can check in, we can Google it. Uh, line the plot to um, line type line type two. but also there is a package there is a package um yeah to dash one f what is it oh you you can uh, talk like uh, more the uh, as book of more than these lines, I think. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, also, there is a, a nice uh, package 
called Jujo Force, Force uh, uh, that actually expands its um, package by Thomas Lee Pedersen. It's one of the main guys in uh, uh, Plot 2 community, one of the main Plot 2 um, developers. And uh, this package really expands a lot uh, Plot 2, gives many uh, scale transformations, new geometries, uh, new faceting, uh, like, really a lot and it's like it's not that just for creating some new uh new type of visualization uh, visualization just for it really like expanding it's deepening the grammar of graphics and maybe we have something like parallel steps drum shapes circle Go on by so yeah, you have some different figures, art bar. For example, uh, there is extension for lines. There is extension for lines that you actually use dots. Yeah, actually, that's something that we, we are interested in here. Uh Circles based on center radius. Uh, wait, 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 wait. What be spline? No. Diagrams. Link point. Points with steps. Yes, this one. Link. I don't pass. Pass interpolate. Uh, but is it possible to specify? Zoom. Yeah, something like that. Or uh, uh, what you can do with it is you can use this gradient because in uh, with this drum link you can use gradient for your uh, integer plot because uh, in original uh, like in basic integer plot too you can do this gradient. So if you have a color, it's either one or two. You can you can uh, use gradient for different entities for different points, but not for one line. So what I wanted to take here, maybe maybe uh, we can use. Uh, maybe we can find if. if it's actually just connected dotted, connected dots. We can actually use line type line and uh, we can find shape and use something that we used here. Thanks to layer. I'm not sure that you can use it here, but you can play with it. Maybe, maybe, or you can even alpha start like that. Uh, alpha line type size color. No, I don't think that will it will help help right here. But um, I don't know you can you can you can play with it because I played it to to do some generative art and it was beautiful. Um, but. Um, to um, pass, run pass, uh, but there is no shape. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's interesting question, but I don't have funds right now. Uh, if I uh, had this uh, question for me, uh, a task for me, I would dig for maybe several hours and maybe I would find some answer, but it will be for several hours. Uh, so there is one also, uh, also another um, 
uh, interesting topic that we need to cover with these models is uh, how to compare these models. So which one better? Uh, so if you remember uh, when we did uh, linear models, we had R squared and adjusted R squared that um, uh, calculated uh, uh, based on uh, uh, how much variability we explain by the model. So uh, uh, if we perfectly explained uh, variability in data by our model, R squared was one. If it uh, was completely unexplained, it was zero. I, unfortunately, for more complicated models, we don't have uh, something like that, but we can compare two models one to each other uh, with uh, other instruments. So uh, how do we call it model RT1? So model RT0, I'm sleep, sleep, a uh, model RT. So, so function, ANOVA actually compares here to models using he, uh, he square test. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, you can compare uh, you can compare uh, AIC and BIC. It's AIC information criterion and Bayesian information criterion. Uh, uh, in both cases, the formula is very similar, but there is some difference, uh, not really important in our case, uh, that basically uh, has more or less the similar logic as R squared. Uh, so the better our model explains the data, or actually we talk here in terms of uh, likelihood. So um, like um, how probable to get uh, this data uh, if uh, in case uh, that our model is correct, but we penalize ourselves for having more parameters. So the, uh, the first model has four parameters. The second one has six parameters as calculated because also uh, there is not also um, with each parameter, you have also a connection between parameters. So we have correlation between these uh, parameters that is also taken in account in the model. So uh, it increases sometimes a lot. So, uh, uh, this AIC and uh, big factors, uh, they penalize for having more parameters. Uh, so in this case, you can, uh, this way you can uh, compare uh, different models fitted for the same data set. So these numbers, uh, uh, these numbers uh, have absolutely no meaning outside of this data set. Uh, they can, uh, they usually positive, but sometimes they can be uh, even negative. And the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, value you have, uh, the better. So the more, uh, uh, the more complicated model has lower IE, and has lower beak, uh, and also uh, heat square test uh, says that yeah this model is significantly better. Uh, so you can, uh, if you want to choose between them, it's reasonable to use uh, the more complicated one because it really uh, uh, increase uh, your. Uh, model quality, even uh, after uh, penalizing for having uh, additional parameters. So that's basically all that I wanted to show you with uh, linear mixed effects models. 
also uh, you can see that uh, for the previous uh, for the previous uh, lecture and seminar you studied uh, log uh, logistical regression that is uh, uh, part of generalized linear model so you have general linear model that actually multiple linear regression plus you have also uh, you, you can also have uh, uh, several uh, dependent variables here uh, and in the framework of uh, general linear model uh, you can uh, actually fit even uh, some ANOVAs, heat tests, uh, and so on. So basically, uh, you do general linear model with this LM function. So LM function is actually for fitting general linear models. Uh, but for uh, uh, sometimes linear a general linear model is not enough. And uh, extension of linear model uh, uh, for having uh, other but everyone uh, you want to, to fit logistic regression that is not a uh, linear model and uh, general uh, linear model and logistic regression, Poisson regression, and so on is generalized linear model. So uh, in basic R, you use GLM function for that, right? So you need to, uh, here you need to, to put a family function for fitting, but actually formal uh, was the same as for LM function. So it was more like the same. And a linear mixed FX models is a different way to extend linear, uh, general linear models. So they're just parallel ways, generalized linear uh, models and linear uh, mixed FX models are somewhat parallel ways to extend uh, general linear models, right? Uh, but also uh, using the uh, package LMV4, you can also use extension of extension. Extension. You can use generalized linear mixed effect models. Mixed effect models. Uh, sounds crazy, but there is nothing really complicated about that. You just use instead of Olmer function, you use G L L M E R, and then everything else is the same as for. Uh, using both uh, um, GL, uh, GLM, but you uh, also, uh, so you, you, you put a family of function and so on, uh, but also you, you have uh, uh, random effects. Or you can think about that as an as a, uh, extension of uh, simple uh, uh, linear mixed effects models when you also, can have not only uh, for dependent variable, you can have, for example, binary variable. So you uh, use this link function, uh, you set family for the function and so on. So yeah, I hope you understand what I mean. I can even, I think I can even draw it because basically there are some more complicated models uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? The things that I really like. Draw. Yeah, I'm really uh, Maybe you have any questions? I can answer. So here is a PLM. Uh, I will not use. Uh, here you have generalized linear mixed effects. Well, and here you have 
Ну, мем. And taken together, you can have generalized generalized polynomial. And actually, you can find even some more extensions, but most of them, they're like some extension of GLM. So GLM is in the center of everything, basically. So simple to tests like uh, t-tests, ANOVA, uh, MANOVA, simple linear regression, uh, Pearson uh, correlation coefficient, they all can be see, uh, seen as a, a uh, specific случай, particular case of uh, general linear model. And other methods that do not fit in this uh, framework, uh, they can be considered as a like uh, uh, extension of general linear model. So everything is either particular case of general linear model or some kind of extension of general linear model. Uh, of course, not everything. For example, cluster analysis, I don't know how to put a cluster analysis in this framework. I think there's no way. Uh, so for some complicated multidimensional methods, it, it doesn't work. But basically uh, you can, like most of the methods, uh, like you can fit in this model. Uh, okay, maybe some questions because that's really all that I wanted to, to show you today. Maybe comments, questions. If no, let's finish and see you next time. Right? Okay, so bye guys. Thank you.